Hello and welcome to Talking Gnosticism, our even more chill than usual uh, Twitch show that we actually put out on all the other places that we put out shows, but you can watch it live, you can interact with us, you can contribute, uh, you can talk to us in the chat. If you ever want to come on the show, just email me, chances are you can, and if you're some sort, if you're the wrong kind of psychopath, let's say if you're a psychopath, and I'm a psychopath, if you're the wrong kind of psychopath, that's fine, come on on. Okay, the topic tonight is a very... Very, very Gnostic Christmas. So joining us is Bishop Tim of the AJC, straight from Australia. It's the height of summer there. Hello, Bishop Tim. The height of summer, but still actually not warm yet because, mm. anyway, climate change, La Nina, etc. Yeah. And we got B back from Divine Spark. Hello, B. Hi. Thanks for having me. Jason, you know him. He doesn't get an intro. Hey, Nick Lachetti, <laughs> friend of the show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, repeat, nice. repeat guest. Nice to be back on. Theologian, writer, all-around swell guy. Uh, so, at Esoteric Christmas, uh, I'll start because I had the biggest mouth. The smallest brain, the biggest mouth. Which is, uh, I really best, love this time the of the year. Christmas lights. I just need to call out oh, okay. the best Christmas lights. Thank you. We actually haven't decorated yet, which is really late for us. Um, we, uh, I, I'm a little psychopathic. And talk about being crazy. Talk about being unhinged. Uh, you know, I, I'm a 40-year-old uh, childless man obsessed with Christmas. This is probably not healthy for me, even with looking at it as a practicing esoteric Christian. Uh, but we, we have three Christmas trees. Um, uh, we decorate the whole house just for the two of us and the cat. It's not, it's not healthy. But I've always really loved uh, this time of the year. I've always really loved Christmas. Um, and uh, I, I do feel like it, like it's a powerful, mystical time of the year, especially for us in the in the northern hemisphere, where uh, just the, the short days, the psychological effect of that, uh, the sort of liminal time, uh, feels so so powerful. Um, the the thing I love about Christmas, I, I guess I'll go range my spiel for it as an esoteric magical time, which is the secret for Christmas is that it's the Christmas we all know and love, but it's actually also Halloween and Easter. So my thesis is, is that Halloween and Christmas are actually all one season. And we sort of have this with previous, and of course, you know, I'm talking about a lot of different cultures, a lot of Christian cultures, a lot of pre-Christian cultures, and just sort of lumping them all together. But, but in many cultures, uh, a lot of the stuff we associate with Halloween was actually associated with Christmas. And this makes, in some ways, a lot more sense in Halloween because it is uh, right around the solstice, which is the, the time of the year that has the longest night and the shortest day. So if you're thinking about the powers of darkness, when are they going to be at the most powerful? Well, it, it, it seems logical. Uh, for uh, ancient peoples to make that connection. We, we have some hints of this in, um, uh, like, Hamlet, right? Uh, you know, hey, the Hamlet runs into his father's ghost on Christmas, Christmas Eve. And uh, now that the Krampus is back, we have some of these uh, Christmas devils returning. But uh, even in contemporary times, like, uh, there's, um, like, uh, the equivalent of Halloween, the Day of the Dead, in some parts of Germany is the first Sunday at Advent. In some of the Nordic countries, they set uh, the table for those that have died for the, at the Christmas dinner. Uh, in other Eastern European countries, uh, like what they do in Poland and... Um, Mexico on the Day of the Dead, they actually do on Christmas Eve, so they go to the cemeteries, they light candles, they clean the tombstones, they connect with the dead. Uh, and my, my theory is to sort of liven up Christmas, to put the emphasis on Jesus, to make it jollier, that even though Halloween already had these connotations, it's all one long season, we push some of that back. A couple of months on the Halloween, so Halloween becomes the entire receptacle for all the dark parts of Christmas. Um, but it also is Easter because it's, it's a time of death and resurrection. For ancient peoples, you know, a lot of them seem to think that the sun was, was born on, uh, on the solstice around Christmas, uh, which, you know, later Christians came along and made that connection too, right? This must be the time that, that Jesus was born. And there's lots of accusations of Christians stealing from pagans, which I don't think is quite accurate if you think about the mindset of the time. This, you know, this makes sense, right? Jesus is is the, the, the son. He is the son of God. I mean, I know that that synonym doesn't work in other languages. But if you're looking at this as a cosmic event, for ancient peoples, they would look towards the cosmos. Uh, and that God would have imprinted into the cosmos. Uh, and he would have chosen for his son to be born on that day. It, it, it makes sense with that kind of logic. But... 
birth of the sun, but really death of the sun. So for me, I have really bad seasonal affective disorder. Uh, Bishop Tim, we can talk about that because I'm sure you probably don't at Christmas time. It's a particularly dark and cold Christmas this year. This is the first Halloween, or sorry, now I'm getting mixed up. This is the first, uh, uh, I'm going to have a couple gl glasses of Christmas nog soon. So I'm going to get even more articulate. But um, this is this is the first uh, uh, um, winter that I haven't uh, been on SSRIs. I traditionally go on them just for the winter. Sometimes I stay on them longer. But I usually go on them, go off them, go on them, go off them. Uh, this year I'm not doing it. It might have been a huge mistake because it feels like I have horrible jet lag all the time and my brain is trying to kill me. But this is how I remember feeling growing up. But the thing is, you know, every day day by day until the solstice the days are getting shorter at christmas the days start getting longer so for me it always kind of felt like a death because every day there's less light and i'm getting more and more miserable but i love christmas so much it cheers me up um so for me personally i always have this little november december death and resurrection but I think for, for ancient peoples, for esoteric Christians, they would have made similar similar connections. And some of that, that birth, death, resurrection uh, symbolism that, that we associate with Easter, it's also found in the Christmas story, in, Christians, in uh, Christian symbolism, uh, in Christmas symbolism, in the symbolism of the evergreens, the resurrected trees. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my spiel. Somebody else, go. The, Talk about anything. The tangent, but um, I'm part of a. I'm in a Chinese family. My partner's Chinese, and so I'm part of his family. And uh, I have been for. This blew my mind recently to realize that's been 17 years. Whoa! Wow. So Congrats. I've had the 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 beautiful experience of doing Chinese New Year with Chinese people um, a few times in Malaysia, and um. So New Year for Chinese people is Christmas, and so it functions the same in a family that Christmas does for, for European folks. So it's the whole family comes together, and you eat a big meal, and you, you give Chinese people a practical, so you get a little red packet with cash in it instead of gifts, you know. Here, have some cash. Um, <laughs> I, I, this is, I, you know, I just went on a long rant about how much I love Christmas, but I think I'm switching over to this holiday. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> pretty, <laughs> well, so one of the things of, um, of actually going, like being in a family for it is you get to actually watch like what a family actually does. And, and so the, like a huge part of New Year is the, on New Year's Eve, they have, there's a, there's an ancestor feast, right? So yeah. like the whole family was one particular year with the whole family sat around and you know, there's those prayer sheets you get from Chinese knickknack shops that have got like gold leaf on them. So you fold those into these little origami um, impersonations of, of gold ingots from the imperial era in China. There's various ways of doing this. Each family has their own preferred way of crafting a piece of paper into an imperial gold ingot. You, in, in, in Min's family's case, you get a giant washing basket full of these because the whole, all the kids are set to kind of paper folding imperial gold ingots for the giant basket. So several washing baskets are filled up with these things. And then you set out, uh, you cook the special dishes and you set out a table and you put the dishes out on the table and you light some joysticks. Um, and then there's this amazing ritual moment where you invite the ancestors to show up. So the, the eldest son and Min's mum, who's the matriarch of the clan, get together and they, they pray to the ancestors. I couldn't hear what they're saying. They pray to the ancestors to show up. And, and then you throw two coins. And if the coins come up heads, heads, the ancestors are there. And so it's good, we can go. But if it shows up tails, tails, they're not ready. They have, they're not there yet, you, we have to wait. And if it shows up heads, tails, it means they're here, but something's wrong. Mm. Figure it out. <laughs> That's really cool. Uh, so the, like, the first time I went to this, it, it, was, it was heads, tails, right? So everyone's like, we've done all the things, the food is here, we've got everyone's favorite food, we've got the joysticks, we've done the same thing we've done every year, it's fine. And through it again, heads, tails, it's just the wrong time, maybe? So we waited for like 10 minutes, they did it again. Like I, heads, got, I, got, I have family like that too, yeah. Right. Yeah. Heads, or tails, heads and tails three times in a row, and then it's at some point someone went, oh, 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 it's Linda the eldest daughter she's with her husband's family because you go to the husband's family for new year so she's not here so they're expecting linda and linda's not here so they explain to the ancestors that linda wasn't here because she was at her husband's family heads heads um, <laughs> <laughs> um and 
Yes, this is my, this is my, one of my favorite stories because like I swear to you, like I at some point I kind of had this sort of like sense that there's some reality to this actually. Like this is a real thing that's going on here. This isn't just a meaningless family tradition in some way. This is a real thing that is happening here. And I, I, you know, did that thing where you kind of twist your senses slightly to kind of like what is actually happening, you know? And I tried to kind of sense what is actually happening here. And, and I got this, you, I got this like impending sense of a great crowd waiting while we're, well, they're going through all this. And then, um, this is a really meaningful moment because when they lit the joss and they started putting the uh, vast piles of gold into the half of a 44 gallon drum full of charcoal to burn it all, to send the ancestors wealth, I got this overwhelming wave of gratitude, just this huge outpouring of gratitude. And the sense of it was, they remember us. Yeah. We're remembered. So I tell that story partly because that is one of my favorite Oogie Boogie Spirit stories and it really meant something to me. But also just to kind of say, I think there's something to what you're saying, that there's some, that, that coming together at the, at the darkest time of the year, not so much the darkest time of the year when you live in Malaysia or Australia, but still, that coming together as a family and that acknowledging that the family includes all the ancestors, the countless beings that came before this this particular family that we think of as family that form the context and the basis and the reason for the family being there. I think that's a huge part of, of a family gathering. So your, your Halloween to Christmas thing includes your strange American tradition of Thanksgiving, which I find charming yet baffling. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, exactly. Be right in there. Yeah. Us, yeah. Uh, us Canadians find it baffling as well. Yeah. We do yeah. in October. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the um, correct time for Thanksgiving. Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry, but the, Jason, before you go, I'll, I'll quickly say, because I was talking to a friend in America who knew that our Thanksgiving's on a different date, so I've been trying to convince her that Canadians do Christmas in February, because I'm like, you know, winter is, it gets worse in January and February here, so it makes more sense to do Christmas uh, in February, and then I said we move, uh, and then our Valentine's Day is April 1st, and then our our, our New Year, or our, uh, our April Fool's is July 4th, so <laughs> I, I think I have her convinced... I've been trying. We we have some other Canadian friends in con, in in uh, common, so I've been telling them, "Hey, if, you know, if she asks when Canadian Christmas is, just say February." Uh, go, go ahead, Jason. Jonathan Stewart, uh, yeah. a professional writer, hobbies: colon gaslighting for the lulls. <laughs> That's right. Yes, <laughs> national gaslighting. Um, uh, what was I going to mention? Oh, um, uh, so. The like w one of the one of the great Christmas traditions is ghost stories, as evidenced by Charles Dickens, um, mm -hmm. with uh, like a Christmas Carol. And now, like a Christmas Carol wasn't just like a brainchild, like an, an idea that he had. He was operating out of a tradition of ghost stories at Christmas, um, and uh, only because we know the Christmas Carol story so well now. Do we just essentially default right to all of the good things that happen at the end? Like, what day is it, boy? You know, but you know, it's actually like there's there are terrifying productions and interpretations of of uh, Christmas Carol that are all about scaring the crap out of you um, before <laughs> you know before you get to the to the moralizing. Whoop! Um, oh, here's my Christmas cat. It's another Canadian tradition. As 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 long as we're gaslighting other nations about uh, Christmas traditions, here's Mucho, the Canadian Christmas cat. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, no, I think there's there is something there about the the like things getting like a, a veil's getting thinner the closer you get to that transition period um and uh and i mean the other thing too is like i was reading a, a newsletter today talking about how you know the end of the year like whether or not you're you're looking at christmas or new year's all you're going to be doing is thinking about everything between the last christmas and or the last new year's and this one so you uh which will often include the people that you've left behind um, or the, the 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 changes in your life, and that those are the, that that creates essentially this like mega transition moment, <laughs> you know. Like here's your Christmas present. I got you all of your memories over the last year. I hope they're good ones. Um, uh, yeah, and I think there's there's something interesting, I think spiritually about that too. Like that can be both both good and bad depending on how on how you take it. Um, what's the like? Uh, 
uh, I'll stop riffing here in a second, but I, I think uh, um, I think it was Jordan Stratford that had a post or something that said something about like the the archon of time is not like literally the the seconds and hours in the day. It's it's being late for for um, your meeting. It's like not having enough time for lunch. That's the archon of time that we're dealing with. Like where you the 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 grind. Um, and I think the that kind this kind of process of examining the year can can either be moment like it can be moments where you're both you're facing both the archons and those like little cracks of the logos uh depending on the choices that you made over the intervening time and maybe hopefully you're you you plan for the next year to have more logos and less archon yeah i think that's awesome uh, b do you have do you have speculations theological speculations on christmas or any of the topics where we're we're riffing upon I have some witchy thoughts if we're yeah. available for those. The resident witch in the chat. Um, no, I love all of these connections because we use the wheel of the year, which starts at Halloween or November 1st, what, whatever, you know, at midnight when, when we hit November um, to usher in Samhain, which is also referred to as the witch's new year. So now we're seeing this um, shifting of the holiday or the new year season up to Halloween to a little bit closer because of exactly what you're all saying. That's when you know, the veil, which is already thin, gets thinner and we begin to reflect on the year that, that happened and the year we're ushering in, which obviously includes the ancestors as well. And then uh, we would recognize on the 21st, on the solstice in December, uh, Yule would be the Germanic holiday that has been, has been claimed by the Witch's Wheel of the Year. And so, uh, a time of renewal and resurrection and, and also death and hibernation as we move into the darker months. So it is, in my opinion, and of course, it has to be all very connected regardless of of kind of what what canon you're looking at or what school of thought you're, you're involved in. But um, Bishop Tim, I loved that story. Thank you for sharing that. It was so moving and, and so cool. I do think that there, um, the, the ghostly aspects of, of the holiday season have always kind of rang true for me. And I think if we hold the whole, then that's also why the holidays can be so joyful as we all gather, but also quite difficult for folks depending on their familial situation, or I also yeah. have a seasonal, <laughs> seasonal sadness. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a time where where we are quite literally in the dark, but we have glimmers of the light. And, and at least, especially with, with Yule, that's what we celebrate, like the coming of the light on the darkest night of the year. So I think linking it all the way back into the Jesus story to, to um, celebrate the coming of the light, the sun being born definitely makes sense from where I'm sitting. Yeah. That that's a that, that's awesome. Thanks so much. Um, and it's nice to have the the witchy perspective, which uh, something I, I really actually kind of liked is that you know this is a time of the year that you can celebrate from a few different traditions, right? And a few you know there's a number of religions that have important holidays around this time of the year. You know, usually connected to life. Um, and I, I actually, I really liked, um, so I saw some like internet atheists posting, this, this is a long rambling story, but internet atheists posting memes about Christians stealing Christmas from the pagans, which there's some truth about, uh, although some of the claims are over-exaggerated or incorrect, but they were posting it to say, this is why I can celebrate Christmas. So I, I didn't necessarily, you know, um, uh, at the end of the day, I, I, I don't know if I really liked the way they articulated it, but I'm like, yeah, atheists, you can celebrate. Yeah, you know, let's, let's get together the pagans and the Christians and let's all celebrate. And some of that was from, you know, fundamentalists and online Christians uh, telling atheists, you know, if you, don't, if you don't like Jesus, you can't have Christmas, right? So, um, which is uh, uh, completely, completely incorrect, in my opinion. Uh, Nick, do you, do you have some, some theological speculations upon uh, the, uh, the Yuletide uh, season? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love everything everybody's saying. I, I want to say to Bishop Tim just that my family, I'm half Chinese, and we do some of what you're describing. We're not like, we, we got so Americanized that we've lost a, a big chunk of that, though I did grow up 
expecting and relying on the red envelopes every year and i still get them because that one's, a, that one's a keeper that's important that, so i'm that, glad that one we've kept that but because I, I don't have kids yet so we still get the red envelopes so from my aunts and uncles so it's a good good deal and then we don't do the we we even though we do visit the cemetery once a year in that tradition in terms of honoring our ancestors we don't burn the paper money uh, which I'm really sad that we actually don't do. Now, maybe we can start it again at some point, but we're, I, my family's too cheap to give any money to anybody you in the to, afterlife. You need, to seize, you need to seize, your generation needs to seize the family. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree for sure. Because you can buy cardboard iPhones and... I know, it's incredible. This, I've been to some of those stores where you can buy all that stuff and it's, well, that's it's that wonderful. Stuff. I think. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, no, but I, I think the other thing I want to say, just, just thinking about Jason's point about A Christmas Carol and kind of, and and Deacon John as well, just about the kind of the apparitions and, and ghosts and this kind of gothic, like, you know, these traditions that are kind of more gothic or we think relate to Halloween that lead up to Christmas. I think just liturgically, I mean, this is a little, it gets a little more boring because it's like the liturgical calendar kind of conversation. But, you know, if you, we're not actually in Christmas yet is the other aspect of that, even though yeah. Jonathan's wearing uh, his Christmas lights. <laughs> we're actually still in Advent for, in terms of like the official, like church history, his, his liturgical season. And I mean, Advent is not actually, it's still, there's moments of joy and, and celebration, but it's also a moment, it's, it's this thing that, uh, a period of, of expectation and waiting um, for this coming. And so I think one, one thing that's interesting to me about Christmas being both Halloween or Thanksgiving and Easter is it's also the end of the world in the Christian tradition in that that's sense. Right. So yeah. you're out, you're waiting for the coming of Christ in, in this Christmas story, but it's also um, you know, an allegory waiting for the second coming and the eschaton. So that kind of aspect is is a little more hardcore in some way, where you haven't gotten yet to the the joy and and the coming yet, because you're still waiting. Um, and then I, I was just thinking of my, you know, I'm, I feel like I mention him every time I do this, but and William Stringfellow again, who's a theologian that I really love, um, has a great passage about how the manger scene is actually this um, kind of very political allegory for creation being set set to order in some way. So you have, you know, the animals in the manger, uh, which is, you know, the animal kingdom, nature, you have uh, the kings coming from multiple parts of the earth. So all of the earth, all of the geography and kind of human authority coming together. Um, you have, you know, the peasants, the angels, everybody there, all, all levels of creation are coming in, are to surround this one point where kind of the light has arrived in creation and things are, are, you know, the fallen world is kind of set to rights. So that to me is always a really powerful image and um, you know, it's a, the manger story becomes kind of sweet, but it's also a really, um, you know, eschatological image at the same time. So I was just thinking about that a little bit. And it might explain some of the spookiness that leads up to Christmas, because it's this period of, you know, in terms of the veil being thin, you, we're talking about the end of the world, kind of, we're, we're thinking about that on, on during those days. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you, I, uh, that's fascinating, and of course, something that is you know, it, if you're not a uh, a regular church goer, really engaged with the with the Christian tradition, you're going to miss all that entirely, right? It's not part of our warm up to Christmas. I think is it the second Sunday in Advent that's specifically about the end of the world and has all the end yeah. of the world, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then, yeah, a lot of the readings about the end of the world, and then you know, the third Sunday is the the pink day, which has all the happy. It, it's always nice. the colors are really great, but yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I'm also a Martinist to, uh, I ride hard, right? So I basically celebrate Christmas, even though Advent isn't Christmas from, from, uh, from Mar Martinist to Candlemas. So I'm a, I'm a Christmas doesn't end to February 2nd. If you lived in Canada, you would understand why, <laughs> um, why I need all of January to be Christmas, but that was the old liturgical, uh, um, uh, uh, set up the you know, Christmas. Uh, the, the, there's 12 days of Christmas, and then Epiphany and Christmas Tide lasted until February 2nd. And I kind of wish you know our society kept that because now we sort of have you know Christmas beginning. I guess it is all one season, but we have Christmas beginning in um, uh, uh, the day after uh, Halloween. Although that's not really true. It kind of begins in mid October now. So, however, I'm not an 80 year old man who's going to rant about uh, Christmas starting too early. Um, some of the uh, the the esoteric and Gnostic stuff. So so specifically looking to to Gnosticism, the the early Gnostics, the Gnostics of the first couple of centuries, which of course was a very diverse movement. I, I'm assuming if Christmas was was up and running then, that they weren't fans of it. And perhaps we can see a parody of the Christmas story in the Cephians, right? Because there's a virgin birth in the uh, Secret Gospel of John, and it's the birth of the Virgin Sophia. 
giving birth to the Demiurge. And I think that that is sort of a deliberate rip on the Christmas story from the Cephians being a, a bit poopy. Um, because it does seem that a lot of the Gnostics, um, uh, you know, they, they had a Christology that was adoptionist, right? Jesus became uh, the Christ at his baptism. The Aeon Christ descended upon him then. Or they, uh, they're they uh, fans of uh, Jesus didn't poop, as we officially call it on uh, Tognosis, which is Jesus was a hologram who was beamed down to Earth one day um, and, and wasn't, uh, wasn't fully human. So chances are a lot of them weren't weren't big fans of of Christmas or the Christmas story or Christmas celebrations at the time. But that doesn't mean that we can't be, and I'm sure some of them were, and of course we've had almost 2,000 years worth of mystics, mystics and Gnostics after them. But yeah, does anybody have any kind of thoughts about kind of specifically Gnostic takes on, 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 on the holiday? I want to respond to that, that specific thing kind of from a couple of dimensions, if that's okay. Yeah. So yeah, you're absolutely right that the... Um, the sort of second third of secret secret john nerd um the second third of the secret book of john um has the scene of sophia giving birth to yaldabaoth the demiurge the the evil creator well deluded creator god i think evil is a bit of a stretch honestly but the deluded creator god um as a virgin birth but the important structural thing with the secret book of john is that that whole second third functions as a parody of the first third of the book right. right so everything that happens in the second part is like a keystone cops mess up of um like bad parody version of something that happens in the first third of the book so the multiple virgin births happen in the first part of the book right barbalo steps forth from the living water surrounding the monad as a virgin birth from the living water and then the autogenes christ is you know manifested amongst the four luminaries as a as a well he's called the autogenies right the self-created so not merely virgin birth but actually self-generated right so of which then sophia's giving birth to elder baoth is a kind of a defective parody of what's already happened in this in the more perfect realm of the pleroma so i think um in a way that mirrors debatably um the 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 kind of reality of christmas as it as it plays out and we're, and we're you know we're living in a weird time where so what we're talking about so nick what you're pointing to with the sort of advent traditions and the kind of beliefs around the coming the coming of the eschaton that's christmas as we all understand it right and so there's a mystical dimension to christmas that parallels that but to which the the kind of the exoteric version functions as a kind of defunct, dysfunctional parody in a way um but you know we're getting multiple layers now because now as well as christmas we have xmas which is the the secular festival that atheists <laughs> celebrate that everyone's part of that involves here in australia i feel like i need to be the token southern hemisphere guy that says yeah yeah christmas it's the time when the temperatures get over 100 degrees fahrenheit and and uh you know you sit on the beach wearing almost nothing because it's so damn hot drinking beer and eating seafood and uh as punishment we make fat middle-aged men dress up in fur suits in shopping centers and and just swelter the entire time it's colonialist Christmas where you've got to work out what all these traditions mean when you're living in a land you weren't, the tradition didn't grow up in. So the X Xmas functions as a kind of even more dysfunctional consumer oriented parody of Christmas, right? So to kind of dig up to the, like, what's the mystical version of Christmas? So the, the, it's an, it's an inner eschaton, right? So the, so the, what we're trying to, what we're looking forward to is the birth of Christ in the human soul. So what you're pointing to, John, with the adoptionist, like the point of the adoptionist paradigm, like the point of saying Jesus was a human being who at a certain moment became Christ, became anointed with the second person of divinity, became the, the fully realized human manifestation of, of divinity shining through an actual human being. So God becomes like the flesh of a human being becomes the the, the, the actual presence of God in the world for the people around them, right? Be not a Christian, but a Christ, I think the Gospel of Philip says. So, right, like, uh, or if you want to go orthodox on it, um, Meister Eckhart, we, we must all become mothers of God, for God is always waiting to be born. I'm misquoting, but it's close. You know, that's my favorite Christmas quote, really. We must all become mothers of God. Um, God is always waiting to be born within us, right? Like in here, inside this human being, like shining through this human being out into the world. This is the manger. 
into which the Christ child is born. And not Jesus kind of manipulating me as a kind of Muppet, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the actual Logos, like coming into being through this human being. So I can, you know, I've just said dysfunctional exoteric parody of, of the mystical reality of, of, of Christ coming into being. But another way to put it is it's a, it's a ritualized foreshadowing of a mystical reality. Yeah. Like the whole liturgical calendar is a ritualized foreshadowing of, foreshadowing of a mystical reality. If we walk the walk and do the stuff, then all this stuff becomes real in our actual human lives, as it has become real in the actual human lives of countless saints before Jesus, after Jesus, hypothetically, should one believe Jesus actually hypothetically existed, hypothetically. Um, it's a real thing. And, but for most people, it can't yet be a real thing because they aren't at a point where that realization is available to them. So we foreshadow it. We, do a, we, we play act it. You know, what, what's a metaphor for it? Well, it's a child being born in a manger in a, you know, with all of creation coming together around them, which is the, the saints tell us is the reality of, of Christ realization is, is kind of understanding yourself being just another fragment of creation, just like everything else. And simultaneously at the very center of creation with all of it radiating around you. Yeah. 100%, no. absolutely thing. Sorry. That was a rant. Well, no, that was a beautiful rant. And I think you're spot on. If, if you are a Gnostic or a mystic, this is what this time of the year is going to mean for you, right? As we try to all give birth to God. I was wondering who's going to whip out the Eckhart quote first. I had it locked and loaded. Um, you know, my, my yearly homily, uh, uh, since I've been doing DHAC, is, is the is a Gnostic take on the, the Christmas story with King Herod, right? Which is, we all have to give birth to the Christ. We all have to embody the Logos. And then what happens when that birth occurs? When the Logos within us is born, but it's not fully expressed, right? It's just, it's just a delicate little baby, which could be snuffed out. The Archons come. That's when they rise, right? Like when does Kim, when does King Herod come to try to kill Jesus, right? Part of the Christmas story, right after he's born. This is what happens when the Christ is born. The forces of the world rise up against it. The Archons notice, and they're going to come, and that's that's what happens with us. That's I mean, not to make anybody paranoid out there, <laughs> but when you when, when the logos is born within you, uh, uh, and, and I'm not necessarily this is of course can be symbolic, right? Uh, you will find that the forces of the world will be rising up against. Um, yeah, so that's. This year, I'm not doing uh, because of COVID nineteen. You know, we're, we're not doing a Christmas get together, so uh, you folks got to hear that that interpretation. I, uh, yeah, just like what you and Nick were saying too uh, about the manger. Uh, so just, just to grab that that point you just made for one sec, the mm -hmm. the tendency when that happens is to think that your job now is to fight them. Yes, because that's the myth. That's the I see your I see your string fellow, and I raise your Walter Wink, Lachetti. Um, <laughs> That's the myth of redemptive violence, that the thing is to, you know, defeat the enemy and then overcome them and then you're all good, right? Which is, a, it's a, it's a, it's silly. It's like, it doesn't, it's not how it works. It's Tom and Jerry stuff, right? Yeah. So what do Mary and Joseph do with the baby Jesus when Herod comes to attack? They don't fight, right? Like they don't raise an army and kind of go, oh, you three magi from the east, surely you've got troops. Come with us and we'll take Jerusalem. They flee. They go somewhere that's safe for them. They take care of the child. They put the care of the child as the primary thing. They look to the safety of the child, not the forces coming to oppose them. Yeah. Something in that. Yeah. No, I think that's spot on. Oh, please be. I, yeah, I want to hop in there too. That's so good. I was thinking earlier, so my wife is Jewish. And so sometimes we partake in family Hanukkah celebrations as well, which is like the, the one holiday we haven't talked about yet tonight. Um, but something that I was thinking about, uh, all of these traditions all have to do symbolically with the candle, right? The candle is the, throughout Advent and uh, Hanukkah and all and Christmas. We have all and Yule. We have all of these these candles and and rituals around lighting the candle and keeping the the flame um, lit. And I think there's something so beautiful too in in this connection that you both are making about not fighting, keeping the child safe. What do you do once the child is born? And I'm just now thinking about it through 
the symbol of the candle. You know, you would you would protect the candlelight. You would make sure that the flame, yeah, like um, hiding it. You would um, ensure that the flame is long lasting, that it can then go on to light other candles along the way. But it is, you know, we have all of these rituals and and symbols of letting the candle go until it burns out and and trusting. That's the mystical aspect that I love of of Hanukkah is that this one candle would stay lit for eight days and go on to light all of these other flames. So I just think there's something um, juicy in there. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, and again, uh, the, we we have some friends who are Jewish. We had a, a great Hanukkah uh, uh, get together this year where I ate many many latkes. Uh, and it, uh, it it turns out that my wife is a dreidel hustler, so she got the stack of coins. And she also turns out that she loves Manischewitz. So uh, so that makes that makes one of us. Um, but uh, something I do want to dig into, maybe do a show on some year, is is a Hanukkah Kabbalah show because I have only read a little bit, but there's some. Very very interesting, deep, mystical, gnostic -y, Kabbalistic speculations upon Hanukkah. Uh, but as I said, I haven't dug in yet, but that's definitely something we're going to be uh, uh, doing uh, one of these years for, for holiday programming. So, but yeah, thanks thanks so much for sharing. And again, you know, just that symbolism of light, right? Even going outside of the Hanukkah story. Um, Nick, you had some, some speculation. Oh, sorry, Jason, did you have something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of come in again on something that uh, Bishop Tim was talking about regarding that um, that that instinctual impulse to find where things are kind of cracking through and like the the, the, the like you 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 feel like you want to be a manger. I think in this time, especially when you're trying to maybe figure out what your what manger you're trying to build for the your you know hopeful logos for next year kind of thing, um, and. One thing I actually want to connect it to is I think even the impulse of um, like uh, uh, John, you were talking about like atheists who were saying like, oh, the Christians just stole Christmas from from the pagans, etc. Is that I think even that impulse is a is a Gnostic impulse, like a, even because often what they're usually complaining about is an is the is like a, a a version of Christmas that they're not even that sure of, but is definitely some derivation on a mainstream. Christian perspective of, of, of Christmas, um, but their their desire to find something deeper and something truer has always struck me as a as a Gnostic intent, like a um, a feeling like there's something more mm -hmm. to find, um, and uh, so like I've always I guess I've always appreciated the uh, the impulse, if that makes sense, even even if sometimes the history and the uh, the the stuff they're riffing on can be dodgy, and often at times is probably more just a retweet than it is a research project for them. But um, uh, but yeah, I I think there's um again I think there's something in this period that makes that makes wanting to ask those questions more urgent. Yeah, I, I, I think that's just it. And I, I too have admired and thought of that as a Gnostic impulse too. So I, I'm really glad that you said that, Jason. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if, you know, maybe those atheists would would, would disagree with us. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it is also a way to to reclaim and understand and connect with Christmas, right? That's what, what the impulse is. And I'm someone who's very interested in origins and where things come from. And, you know, it's one of the shames of my life that not everybody finds that as fascinating, right? When I'm just running around shutting out facts, be like, did you know this came from here? And that doesn't blow people minds um so that digging up right you know these deep rooted traditions why the tree why this why that i find particularly fascinating but i think you're right that it is a you know even if atheists don't realize it it's a um it's it's kind of a gnostic impulse right the gnostics love getting at the, at the root of things um nick um, I, I i was going to oh go ahead Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, like, I'm always a fan of defining Gnosticism as a genre as much as it is a subject. Um, and that, like, yeah. there are a lot of things that can be Gnostic, even if the people involved would disavow it. <laughs> yeah. Precisely. Um, I'm going to. Uh, we have we have some some excellent questions here from Nandalin seventy eight oh one, which is, did Jesus have a twin? Because I never see two babies in the nativity scene. So so famously, 
Thomas, the, the word Thomas means twin. And the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas opens up with the twin of Jesus speaking. But yeah, I've never seen a major scene with, with two babies. But I, I, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, I guess that's not going to help you now, person watching it live. But if you go to the AJC, the Apostolic Jonah Church's uh, YouTube channel, there's an excellent talk on the Gospel of Thomas from, uh, from the Montreal Conclave in 2019, where it does seem that this, this symbolism, this twin stuff seems to be a um uh symbolic as in we must all become the twin of jesus we must all you know we are the flesh part right of the brotherhood and then jesus is the logos if that makes sense that seems to be the symbolism of, of what they're getting to so we're all meant to become twins of jesus that's what the gospel of thomas seems to be saying now we have layers before that or under that, right? Because we have in some of the earliest uh, records of Christianity in the Gospel of Mark, he does seem to have a disciple named Thomas, which, you know, is weird. Is he Jesus' twin or someone else's twin? Um, so it does seem that maybe the Gnostics saw that and then kind of riff on it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've never seen two, two babies in the nativity scene either, but that seems to be what, what's going on with that stuff. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's come back to that question in your celebratory Easter show and we can do the whole... Judas Thomas scapegoat riff. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. No, th there's a lot there. And, uh, more, we can come back to it. Yeah, we'll break out the 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 bar the the Margaret uh, Margaret Barker glasses for that one as well. So, um, yeah. So uh, Nick, did you have some some theological uh, uh, speculations? I think that there was something that you <laughs> wanted to get to with uh, alchemical matter, Mary. Yeah, I, I do have. The, I I told you I was over that. I'm trying to relate it. I. I'm, my mind's moving as I try to relate it to lots of great things people are saying. So it's not just some random comment, <laughs> but I think it does sort of relate, which is I, I've been actually, you know, it's interesting that, that I think Jason, you're saying that um, some pagans responding to this whole, you know, Christmas is based off of, you know, Mithras or whatever, uh, some of that stuff as a way to relate to it. Interestingly, like some of my favorite modern Catholic theologians, um, especially Mariologists have started to kind of, I, I feel like they're sort of utilizing some of the stuff about like the Black Madonna and all of those pieces, which can sometimes, you know, have, have modern um, sort of like not totally accurate, but still really interesting interpretations and actually like pulling that back into Mariology. So one thing that I was just thinking of, uh, thinking about Mary's Magnificat and some of that stuff related to Christmas is um, this idea that uh, Mary is, has a, has a connection because of, you know, giving birth to Christ as the new creation to the original creation. And I'm guessing there's some, I don't, I don't know Margaret Barker that well, but I could see like <laughs> there, be, there being connections there as well. Um, so, so Mary, and especially kind of this image of the Black Madonna as this prima materia or prime matter. Um, so, you know, the darkness over the face of the deep and, um, and that being, you know, an image of the, the first creation and then the second creation that kind of is, is culminating in, in Christmas, um, but also that being the alchemical base matter. So some of this conversation about Eckhart and this idea that we have to give birth to the logos within us, um, you know, there, it becomes a really interesting allegory for um, kind of the 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 prima materia that we have to work on ourselves. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting that some of the, and, and to me like some of the there's a really good Mariologist named Sarah Jane Boss who I really recommend if you're interested in some of that stuff. Who wrote a, just a book called Mary that that's, has some of the stuff in it, and I think like it. You know, it, it's interesting the way that some of this plays into each other. So you have the Christmas story, you kind of have some modern pagan kind of esoteric ways to reclaim it. I feel like then that's feeding back into some of this modern theology um, of imminence and, and other other things. So, yeah, just to know that that there's the Gnostic impulse, if it's if it's not just about ancient texts, but is this kind of way of, of reading things is still happening. So, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Thank you. And actually, you probably really like Margaret Barker has a book, I think it's yes. called The First Christmas, The Original Christmas, mm -hmm. um, which, which is very centered on Mary. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, is kind of talking about Mary in, in the way that you're that you're discussing. So, uh, yeah, I highly recommend that to, to you and to mm -hmm. to anybody else. Um, uh, well, I, it is, uh, we're at a, a little over 40 minutes, so I, I think it's time to start wrapping up. Does anybody have any, any closing Christmas thoughts that they want to get out? Any, any Christmas cheer they need to express? I got, this is a, uh, I don't know, it's in my brain, I want to get it out. Being the sort of, I, I just, there's a thing about, um, it is weird celebrating a midwinter festival in the middle of summer. Um, yes. But then you come to some accommodation with it where this is the peak of the light, right? Yeah. 
So it's the brightest time in the year. It's the hottest, brightest time in the year. So it's the it's the moment where the force of divinity is so strong that it actually breaks through into the world in the form of Christ, right? So we kind of, I don't know if there's much Southern Hemisphere theology about this matter, but... Um, that could be. Then Teilhard de Chardin, to bring another one of these, these Catholic kind of theologians, he has this line where he talks about Mary being a transparency or a purity so great that the light just kind of automatically concentrates to a point in that right. transparency. That feels like you could write a Southern Hemisphere theology of that. <laughs> you think, I don't know, with, with K. Art or something. We need to do a, we need to do a Mary show because, yeah. you know, before Jesus was yeah. Christ, Mary was Christ, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, no, the other thing about, the other thing about Christmas down here is that, like, in the Northern Hemisphere, right, like everybody goes off, you know, the, po the whole place sort of closes down a little bit over summer, right? Because everybody takes lots of lots of leave in summer. And then you've got this other end of the year where you go and see your family at Thanksgiving and maybe you go see your family again at Christmas. And so there's these multiple points in the year. So in Australia, that's all one thing, right? So like the whole country comes to a complete stop between like the 20th of December and about the 15th of January. So because it's summer holidays plus Christmas and we don't have Thanksgiving. So the whole family thing all has to happen over that period. So there's this, it's weird. It's weird in like professional life because everything's like, like it is literally the end of the world, that period, right? Like because nothing can happen. So every project has to get completed before the 23rd of December. Otherwise the world will end, right? So everyone panics. And then you start going to meetings around the 20th of December and people start going, because it's summer, right? Uh, let's face it, it's not going to get done before January because they know in their head they're going on holidays in two weeks' time, uh, two days' time. So they, they don't care anymore. And people just start checking out, right? Because everybody goes off on, on summer holidays until late January. So so there's this lovely, quiet... It's, it is quite a contemplative period in a way because everything sort of comes to a dead stop. If you If you choose not to go on a vacation or something, and to actually just stay put and be with it. It's this really beautiful, quiet, very hot time. Uh, <laughs> I recommend it. If uh, you Northern Hemisphere folks, if you get to spend at least one Christmas at some point in your life in the Southern Hemisphere, you should totally do it. I think you're living in the promise of the light that we're uh, living in the hope of right now. <laughs> That's why I'm the Bishop of the Future, Jason. There you yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a great note to end on. <laughs> Thanks so much, folks, for uh, joining us tonight, uh, both those viewing and, of course, our awesome panelists. And uh, have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. Yeah.